committee, the committee, the committee on college entrance requirements, uh, chaired by a guy named Augustus F. Nightingale, who was famous for his Purple Passage oratory, recommended a series of constants, four years of foreign language required by everyone, two years of English, two years of mathematics, one year of science, and one year of history. Everybody had to have those. Uh, these have changed today. We've upped some, we've lowered some. And then the rest of the coursework would be electives. Now I said Augustus F. Nightingale was the chair and was a Purple Passage orator. This is what he said to the people at the 1899 NEA convention when he presented the There is already a path blazed through the thicket and jungle of conservatism and tradition. And before the 20th century dawns in its glory, there will be a broad highway through which a, people, a pupil may walk unfettered amid attractive associations from the kindergarten to a degree at the end of the postgraduate course of the university. And still will the people of the future be able to say, there were giants in those days. Now, I don't know about you, but I have no idea what I think you was talking about. But, the, but that's the way people talk and wrote at the turn of the century. Purple Passage, it's called. And if you write this way uh, on your dissertation, your major professor will bleed red all over it and give it back to you, uh, perhaps with even hostile comments in the margin. Along comes the College Entrance Examination Board. There's Charles W. Eliot. He's the man with the idea, hey, let's have one college entrance exam. Good thing he was the president of Harvard. If someone else had said that, the idea may not have caught on. Nicholas Murray Butler was the editor of the newly created journal Education, and Nicholas Murray did the work of publishing uh, arguments for the college entrance exam and by giving speeches for the college entrance exam. The first annual report of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. This was in 1906. I'm sure you have heard of a Carnegie unit when you teach your subjects are bookkeeped for the kids in terms of Carnegie units. What is a Carnegie unit? Very trite definition. A course of five periods weekly throughout an academic year. Notice carefully they don't say how long the period is or how long the year is. Nevertheless, we have a Carnegie unit in all states and they're probably different from state to state. Accomplishments of the modern revision movement. Okay, we had those four uh, reports, meetings, committees, what have you. What, what did we accomplish by all of that? One, respectively for what Krug called the modern academic subjects, those nine. Another accomplishment is the college entrance exam board. We now have to sit for one college entrance exam. Prior to this, you wanted to go to Yale, you took their exam. You wanted to go to Harvard, you took their exam. You wanted to go to Nashville, you took their exam. So this definitely simplifies things. It defined the roles of colleges and secondary schools, perhaps it defined the roles. Now we know what the secondary schools are going to teach, and now we know what the colleges can expect when they admit someone from a secondary school. 
It established the elective principle. It didn't really, but it took a step toward the elective principle. I guess with Augustus Nightingale, we do have the elective, elect, elective principle, but not the total 100% one that uh, Eliot had introduced at Harvard. But the movement failed to move, win over some people, classicists. Feared, and they were justified in doing so, a drop in status. Oops, says the Latin teacher, they won't have to take Latin now. I can see that there's not going to be a call for many Latin teachers anymore. I'm not going to be king of the hill like I was anymore. And the vocationalists maintained that the movement had not been comprehensive enough. That's code for, they didn't let us play. It didn't include them. And so, the pendulum swings. Examples of unfavorable post-Committee of Ten sentiment. These are all speeches given at an NEA annual conference. Charles Keyes challenged the position of manual training. Now, manual training at the time was not vocational education. It was something like today's industrial arts where you teach them how to make a hat rack, how to make a tie rack, how, how maybe to deal with small engine repair and the like. This was not for something that you would do for a lifetime. This was for around the house, knick-knack, making and fixing. Charles Keyes called for industrial education. By that he meant we need to teach these kids a saleable skill for a lifetime. Mary Piney, and I'm calling her Piney because J.C. Penny is J.C. Penny. Uh, some people have called her Penny. Uh, I don't think that's right. I think, I think this is Piney, but I really don't know. In nice intellectual speech, I like this. She said, or her point was, to defer industrial occupation until a child can attend to a technical school is to deprive many of hand skill. She is saying, in essence, if you don't let kids use their hands when they're young and they develop these skills, they may never develop them. There may be an optimal time for learning to pound a nail. You know, if you don't start at age five, you're going to have extreme difficulty picking this up. There were a couple of guys a few years back, maybe 20 years back, Doman and Delicato, who, who ran a remedial reading class for adults in which they maintained that the kids who never learned to read were those who never crawled as infants. And so they would have their kids go back, or they would have their adults go back and, and learn to crawl all over again. Uh, I don't know how true that is, but I can tell you, uh, as someone who as a science supervisor had a job of helping the kindergarten teacher catch kids when they were bouncing on a tramble, trampoline. There was an almost one-to-one -one direct correspondence between the kids who could bounce on the trampoline, trampoline and the kids who could read. The kids who could bounce could read. The kids who could not bounce had difficulty in reading. So Mary may have been on to something. There may be a sequence of things that has to happen uh, that we ignore in education. And I've always called for dissertations in which we, we 
try to determine what's the optimum time to teach this concept. What's the optimum time to teach this other concept? Enough said. Be a Lenfist talked in support of vocational trade schools. So you've got folks here from vocational education saying the Committee of Ten did not go far enough.